So now we'll start talking about uh, spectroscopy, which is a really quite a large part of organic chemistry. Uh, it covers all the analysis of organic compounds that we make. And then we will start talking about infrared spectroscopy also in this one, although it's not finished in this uh, little presentation, but at least we'll start talking about it. Okay, so uh, spectroscopy is something that is used in organic chemistry a lot for determining what the structure of a compound is. And so we use a variety of techniques to figure out what the structure might be in case you've synthesized a new compound or you've isolated a new compound and you want to know what the structure is, okay? And so it, it depends on the spectroscopy and it may destroy the sample or it may not destroy the sample. But in most cases, you need a very little amount of sample. So even if it's destroyed, hopefully you did not lose some of your precious sample. Um, what we will start with in the spectroscopy initially is uh, all dealing with light, okay? And light doesn't mean the visible light, it means electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Anywhere in that region. So we will talk about that uh, in the spectroscopy part. Basically, the four spectroscopies that we will talk about are ultraviolet spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, and nuclear magnetic resonance, okay? UV, IR, and NMR, they're all coming out of the electromagnetic spectrum, whereas the mass spectroscopy, MS, is a completely different kind of spectroscopy. So for the first three, you need to understand the relationship between electromagnetic spectrum the energy, frequency, wavelength, all of these things, okay? And so uh, that's what we will start with uh, in, in this presentation. And then I'll start off with infrared spectroscopy, okay? Nuclear magnetic resonance is really quite a big spectroscopy on its own, and it requires a lot more time, okay? UV and IR are very closely related to each other. So we will talk about IR first, and we will go on to UV and so on. Okay, so just a little review for electromagnetic spectrum. You've seen this in Gen Chem and hopefully in physics also. But um, the electromagnetic spectrum consists from radio waves all the way to gamma rays. Okay, so this is how it goes. And then there are two things that we talk about in case of electromagnetic spectrum. One is the wavelength and the other one is frequency. Frequency is not given over here, but wavelength is. Okay, and this is given to us in centimeters. So you can see that our radio waves have a really long wavelength, whereas the gamma rays have very short wavelength, okay? The other thing I want you to see what is correlated here with the wavelength is the energy, okay? So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, all right? Um, the other correlation I want you to see here is also a frequency, okay? And the frequency is... So let's talk about the IR region then, okay? And so uh, the IR is going to be near the uh, red region of the visible region because it says infrared, so it's near the red region. The wavelength is usually 2.5 to 25 micrometers. Don't worry about this so much because we're gonna talk about wave numbers and then we'll talk about the scale separately, okay? And uh, the wave numbers are directly proportional to frequency and energy because wave number really is one over centimeter, okay? And one over centimeter, which means the inverse of wavelength is also frequency. So it's a direct correlation, but we will talk about that when we get to an IR spectrum. So what really happens in the IR is vibrations, okay? And so when the IR radiation passes through the molecule, the bonds will start vibrating like a spring, okay? And remember, uh, the bonds are made up of electrons, and these electrons are in orbitals. And so all that is happening in those orbitals is that the electrons will start vibrating, all right? And so the vibration that can occur can be different kinds, all right? So there's a stretch. In the stretch, there is a symmetrical stretch, asymmetric stretch, then there is bending going on. <clears throat> so there's all sorts of kind of uh, vibration modes going on. And the more you become uh, good in IR, the more you try to understand these kind of vibrations. And you are able to predict also, okay, what kind of vibrations to expect. And then you read the spectra a little bit better, okay? Um, one of the things that is not written over here, and that is an important part of uh, IR spectroscopy, is that the IR is observed only by certain kind of bonds, and those bonds are usually going to be uh, polar covalent bonds. So a lot of the covalent bonds will vibrate, and a lot of the molecules do have some sort of polarity okay, to it. So almost everything will actually give you a vibration, 
but there are very few molecules who do not have any kind of polarity or they're very symmetrical. So they, they will not show up, okay? So not every molecule is going to be IR active. So this is a little bit of an introduction to where the IR absorptions occur. So 400 to 4,000 is the scale that you will usually see in IR. And again, remember this is in uh, wave number, okay, which is one over centimeters. And so that's going to be the scale. And these are some of the regions where you will actually see vibrations going on. So from 4,000 to about 2,500 is where you see all the bonds with hydrogens. That's where there will be vibrating. Triple bonds will vibrate between 2,500 to 2,000, which is three triple bond C and then C triple bond N. Those are the only two triple bonds that we deal with. The double bonds fall into this region with the 2000 to 1500. And then there are all these single bonds, okay, that come over here. This region, by the way, from 1500 to 400 is also known as the fingerprint region, okay? And so here, um, this is the high frequency area. Remember, this is one over wave number, okay? So this is the high frequency, this is low frequency. So here, all the lighter atoms, are going to be vibrating with a higher frequency. Here, the heavier atoms are vibrating at a lower frequency, okay? So that's kind of how you figure out where you can actually start looking for some of these vibrations. And then you can come up with your own pattern also, okay? As you start looking at uh, IR spectra more and more, then you get used to all of these uh, vibrations and where they appear, so you start recognizing the pattern. A few things to note about uh, certain of the bonds, as was shown in the previous slide also, is uh, how the frequency decreases with increasing atomic mass, okay? And so if you remember the CC, uh, the CH bond was all here, the CC was all here on the right-hand side. So the CC, okay, which is carbon-carbon, is 1200, which means it was low frequency, it did not vibrate enough, okay? Whereas the CH, was at a higher frequency, was vibrating at a higher frequency, okay? So at that particular energy. So that's kind of a pattern, all right? So you can take any bond. It doesn't have to be H, D, and C. And D, by the way, is deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, an isotope of hydrogen. So you don't have to look at H, D, C. You can look at any other atom. So for example, C, F, C, C, L, CBR. If you're looking at the halogens, then even the halogens will have the same predictability. That is that the CF will be uh, coming at a very high frequency and CBR will come at a lower frequency. Okay, that's how it will be. And the other pattern that we see generally is with the uh, single bonds and triple bonds. The triple bonds usually occur at a higher frequency and the single bonds appear at a lower frequency. And you can go back to the slide and you can see that again that the triple bonds were around 2200, whereas the single bonds were all in the fingerprint region, okay? And so that's how the pattern is. And this, again, would be the pattern for um, if you were looking at C with a single bond N, double bond N, and triple bond N also, okay? Same kind of pattern. IR is generally known as a fingerprint of a molecule. Why? Because each compound has its own bonding, Okay, has its own structure, and because of that, no two molecules can give the same IR spectrum, except for enantiomers. Okay, enantiomer is exactly the same, but other than that, um, all molecules will vibrate at a at something or the different thing there. Okay, if nothing else, the fingerprint region on the right hand side, okay, from 1200 to 400, is going to be different. All right, and so it's known as a fingerprint of a molecule, which means that if you wanted to identify an unknown molecule, then you have to, um, you know, you can check it with the database if you want to, or if it's a new thing that you've synthesized, well, then you have to submit it into the database, okay? And so um, that is how each molecules are, okay? Is that they are very, very unique. Okay, and then a little bit about the IR active and inactive, and as I mentioned before, that a polar bond usually will give uh, IR spectrum or IR vibration, and a non-polar bond will not do that, okay? So for example, in this compound over here, which is butyne, in 2-butyne, you have three kinds of bonds, okay? You have the CH bond, you have the C single bond, you have the C triple bond, 
Okay, so those are the three bonds that you have. It's a highly symmetrical molecule. The CH bond will show up, no problem, okay, because that is going to have a type, uh, it's going to have slight polarity. The CC bond will show up because the two bonds on the either side are going to be different, and so it will show up. But the C triple bond C will not show up, okay, in the IR because now the bonds on either side are exactly the same, all right? And so because of that, because of that symmetry, the IR is, this molecule is IR inactive. And doesn't mean that the molecule is in IR inactive. It's this bond, okay? It's the alkyne. So C triple bond C is not something that you will see in there, okay? If you have two butyne. If you change the alkyne from the second carbon to the first one, now you should be able to see it. And when we go on to the next presentation, then I will talk about those because in that I'll go through each functional groups. This is what an IR will look like, and this is really a schematic. Uh, this is uh, not what it would look like, of course, in the lab. Um, it's a little bit more sophisticated than this. But usually you will have um, a source that will give you the infrared radiation. Depending on what kind of an IR you have, you may have a dual beam or a single beam. In case of a dual beam, you have two beams going on, which means you have a reference cell and you have a sample cells. A lot of IRs these days, they're actually all single beam, so which means you don't need a reference, all right? So you just keep your sample, and then um, the IR radiation goes through, it goes through a, a mirror, and then the detector, and then of course you have the output, which usually is a computer, okay? Or, or a chart, whatever it might be. It used to be chart before, but now it's a computer. So uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Now, the sample itself, the cell, this is an interesting part because now the sample cells are changing quite a lot. They used to be in a compartment before, but sometimes now you can actually uh, keep the uh, IR sample right on the top. Uh, so it, it depends on what kind of an instrument you have in your lab, but basically, schematically, it's going to be the same. Okay, instrumentally, it will be the same. Um, how it works in reality is slightly different and depends on the manufacturer and each of the uh, spectrophotometer. The way you prepare the sample for solids, uh, in some cases, you will still need to make a pellet using KBR. Potassium bromide is IR inactive. So uh, usually you will take a little bit of the solid and just, uh, just mix it up with KBR. Use a pellet press, okay? And the pellet press will give you a pellet which really looks like a dime size sample then, okay? So it's, it's a circular sample and it should be transparent, okay? And that's how fine your uh, pellet preparation should be. But these days, again, our instruments are getting sophisticated and a little bit better. You may not even need to make a pellet, okay? But it depends on the instrument you have in the lab. You may need to make it. And in those cases, you use KBR, okay? Potassium bromide. For liquids, you will use two salt plates. And again, the salt plates are going to be potassium bromide or sodium chloride, which are IR inactive. And so for the two, li uh, for liquid samples, you'll just place the sample between the plates, which really look like blocks of uh, salt and then you will analyze your sample, okay? The only problem sometimes is that sample is lost in the analysis, okay? Because if you're making a pellet and you're, you're mixing it in KBR, then it's gone and you really, you're not going to wipe off the salt plates to get your sample, okay? So usually your sample is lost in IR uh, spectroscopy. FTIR, and I just want to mention this, I don't want to delve on this too much, is um, FTIR is called Fourier Transform IR Spectroscopy. And FTIR is usually all the instruments these days are going to be um, FT, which is Fourier Transform. And what happens is that uh, with Fourier Transform, it has a lot more sensitivity. It's, it's actually, a, it's something that, yeah, that has been developed in the instrument itself, okay, which, which makes it work faster and uh, with a great sensitivity and the instrument is usually calibrated by itself. And then the spectra that you get, okay, is, um, it's really quite accurate, okay? And the resolution is very good for FT spectrophotometers. So uh, most of the instruments these days will be FT, which is Fourier transform. And that's actually a mathematical calculations that are usually done uh, to make your 
uh, detector better okay and so uh, this is the kind of spectrum that you get usually from any any um, spectrophotometer and then after the calculations with FT and all that this is the spectrum that you end up getting which really is a lot more readable than just reading lines going up and down these lines going up and down is a lot easier to read okay because here you can see the CH stretches and then the CH2s and whatever else that there might be in it okay so this is kind of the output after for your transform calculations okay so usually you will see like this you you will probably not see anything like this okay because for your transform outputs are really fantastic so the key concepts that you need to know from this little uh, presentation is that the basics of the electromagnetic spectrum, please know the energy and the frequency and the electromagnetic spectrum itself, okay, which one has higher energy, which one is less, know how the IR works, which means how it works as in vibrations, okay, and all that, and then of course be able to predict the relationship between bond energy, bond length, okay, and all of that, and where it will appear in the IR. Uh, regarding getting to the functional groups and all that, we're going to do that in the next presentation.